this current system is is literally going to end in like 15 to 20 years, this system's not going to exist anymore. There's going to be something else. But what that something that looks like could be the end of us, or it could be something else, yeah. something good, something really interesting yeah. and viable and amazing. But that's up to you guys. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Nafiz Ahmed. Nafiz is an investigative journalist and strategist who now works on the architecture of systems transformation. I interviewed him a few months ago with Simon Michon debating the energy transition. And Nafiz now joins me again to discuss his vision for a renewable world. We can reorganize our economies and our geopolitics based on how we choose to build the infrastructure of the next phase of human civilization and the impact this would have on the global system. We talk about the inevitability of collapse of certain incumbents within the current system, the fact that this system is stuck on a continuous, seemingly irreversible loop, and the infrastructure which could allow a new system of organization to emerge. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Nafiz, thank you so much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. So tell me, why is the world in crisis and what can we do about it? Wow. You start with a blinding opening. Um, <laughs> that's a huge question, but I think um, it boils down to um, the the nature of the system that we're living in on the, on, on, on this planet. Um, I think we're in crisis because fundamentally the nature of our, uh, production system and the nature of our organizing economic system and the nature of our governance systems. And these are all really interconnected things. And I think fundamentally there are, there is something deeply wrong with them. Um, and that's probably a big, a big thing to say. That doesn't mean that everything about everything in this system is necessarily bad and evil and has to be done away with. But there is something deeply fundamentally wrong with with the prevailing industrial paradigm. Um, and I think it boils down to the fact that everything that we have kind of uh, structured ourselves around these days essentially alienates us from nature. You know, we find ourselves separated from the natural world, separated from each other. Um, and we see this in our economics, you know, we see this in, in the fundamental, the way in which, uh, capitalist relations of production are organized. We see that in how that then spreads into other areas of culture, ideology, the way we see the world, uh, you know, the way we understand ourselves, our place in the world, it's very much about, um, you know, individual maximization. Um, defined in very kind of materialist terms, you know, like maximize you know, self accumulation of things and, you know, material, physical feelings, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that it's not working. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's got us to a certain point where we have, um, an amazing understanding now about of, of, of the way things work to some extent. Um, you know, we've definitely created amazing new innovations in health, you know, in 
you know, we've solved so many diseases. There's lots of good things that we seem to have done. But I think what's, you know, what's very alarming about it is that with all those great things, there's also been these huge costs. And we don't, I think that, that, that's kind of, it's, it's come as a shock to us to realize that there are these costs associated with some of the great things that we're doing. And so we're finding that quite struggling. And again, that's all part of this very fragmented way that we tend to think about things. You know, there's, everything's great. And then suddenly it's like, oh, you know, we're driving our cars. So, oh, but wait a minute. Now we know that cars are polluting and produce this horrible, um, stuff that is contributing to the atmosphere. So there's all sorts of issues around that. Um, but overall, I think that, I think it really, it boils down to that. And there's some, there's, there's this, this paradigm is fundamentally pushing us on this trajectory of uh, which, where we can see we like, you know, we're going to hit multiple walls and it just can't go on and something needs to shift. Um, so I think the good news in this scenario is that the more we're learning about this stuff, we're, we're at a point in our history as a species where, you know, you know, you maybe go back even 20, 30 years, but, you know, go back hundreds of years. I mean, the amount of understanding that we now have about these issues is unprecedented. I think, you know, we didn't really, you know, understand the, our impact on the planet before, um, but now we're really beginning to see it and we're beginning to develop tools by which to understand these things in a way that we couldn't have done before. And at the same time that we're developing those tools, we're also in the process of developing new ways of thinking about systems, new ways of understanding system change. And the system itself is going through a variety of changes driven by you know, various different processes, but there's all these really rapid changes happening right now. And I think that those changes offer us, which are happening, offer us a direction of travel, which if we understand the risks that we're facing and the opportunities that we're facing, we can make much better decisions about what the next system is going to look like. But I think wherever you stand in that kind of debate, there has to be a new system. It has to be in many ways fundamentally different from the existing system. And it has to be characterized quite fundamentally by a new relationship with, with the natural world. And that's really the bedrock of what has to emerge. And if we don't clinch that, it doesn't really matter all this tinkering and technology and all the stuff we're talking about, it's not really going to mean anything. It's not going to work. But that's really the fundamental thing that has to shift. So I think that's how we get out of this. Um, so it's a big ask. Develop a new system. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think to me, you know, you said that we are developing an understanding that perhaps we didn't have before, like our impact on on the world. And I'm going to say the world rather than the natural world, because I don't want to like play into this binary as if humans are not a part of nature. Um. However, I mean, we were having these conversations in the 70s. Limits to Growth was published in 1972. Um, fossil fuel companies were hiring their own scientists and getting these warnings about the impact on the planet. So I think what's quite scary is in many ways we are having the same conversation, actually, that as, you know, 50 years ago, which is terrifying because things have objectively, you know, gotten worse in terms of our impact on the planet. However what seems to be different now as opposed to then is that back then the system was still in its kind of like exponential growth stage and lots of people in the West were getting lifted up um, out of poverty because there's just so much access to energy, to goods, consumption, all these kinds of things. Economies were just exploding. <laughs> Not exploding, blowing up listeners, but exploding out. <laughs> and so now what seems different is, as you say, something will fundamentally have to change because either we will or our ecology is going to break down to the extent that we don't actually have our food supplies, we don't have our energy supplies, we, we don't have these global supply chains upon which we've come to rely. But it does still seem, though, that power kind of has its head in the sand and is more willing to risk a massive ecological and climate threat breakdown and will not change until that breakdown happens in a country that it considers home enough 
um, before it makes these essential changes. I mean, just this morning, the uh, report came out on the UK government. It's failing to meet all of its climate targets. Uh, climate action has gone backwards rather than forwards. So I know that you're a systems change analyst as well. I mean, how do we change a system when the people with their hands on their levers also have their heads up their asses? Yeah, this is the big question. I mean, I think the challenge that I'm seeing is that I think this is the, the, the data that we have is that there's, there's exponential changes happening all around us. Mm-hmm. And I think we're beginning to develop an understanding. I mean, perhaps, you know, when limits to growth uh, came out, you know, we were only beginning to see, you know, that was one of the, that was one of the first really major studies, I think, which took the systems dynamics approach. Yeah. Um, and kind of, and you know, those, and those forecasts pretty much still stand up today yep. um, in terms of where we are. And since then, you know, we have our understanding of exponential change is, is improved a lot. Now we're beginning to see how, okay, you know, we've seen that exponential change happens in, you know, we've seen it in many technology sectors, um, you know, smartphones, disrupting landlines, blah, 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 that kind of thing. We've seen it every day, you know, with the internet. Now we're seeing it with some good things with that can provide us some, uh, tools to, to change elements of the system. So, you know, solar, wind and all that stuff. We're seeing the exponential change in there. And I think what's interesting is that a lot of those changes in these various tools, I mean, in energy, transport and food, we're seeing these big exponential changes and those changes are, are going to happen in the same way that we've seen technological change does go over, it goes through a certain trajectory driven by these econom- economic dynamics. It's fairly predictable when you look at relationship between costs and um, adoption rates, things like that. But I think what's missing from that analysis is that while that kind of exponential change curve is, you know, maybe it's going to happen, but there's lots of things that will, which will slow down that change. Um, and that, let's just be clear, by the way, that we're not even saying that those tools in themselves have all the answers. We're just saying that they have some potential answers. There's sorts of questions that we need to think about once, you know, as they are deployed. But let's just assume, for instance, that, okay, solar and wind is, 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 is a great thing. It's going to help us get out of this. But is it happening fast enough in any case? It's yeah. just not. It's not. It's not being deployed fast enough. I mean, I just wrote a piece talking about um, a lot of the empirical studies that have shown that which is great news that we look, it looks like we may have passed a kind of a tipping point in the deployment of these technologies. Like they're going to be deployed you know, by the mid mid century, they're going to dominate. You know, the fossil fuels are going to be eventually outmoded. You know, they're going to become obsolete. I know and those things are going to happen, but that's just too late. Yeah, you know, mid century is just too. Mid century is like, guys, what I mean, we're seeing it happen now. So. And that's without even, so that's one thing. The other thing that was interesting about all of these studies is that they said, even if it does happen and it deploys, but if you don't make the right decisions about how it deploys and where it deploys and all sorts of things about access, uh, you know, the way in which, you know, supply chains, where, you know, where are we going to get the materials from? Who is going to have access to these technologies? How is it going to reach Mm -hmm. developing nations? If we don't answer those questions and actually make some deliberative decisions rather than just sitting there saying, well, let's just let technology do the things. If we don't do that. And the market. Yeah. You know, if it's just, if it's just left, to the, left to the market, then sure, we may have these technologies disrupting the older technologies. But here's some scenarios, right? So one scenario is that, yeah, it gets deployed. And there's, there's you know, some you know, investors get super excited and they back some of this stuff. But it all happens maybe in the global north rather than the global south. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, and it takes time to trickle down to the global south. That's one potential scenario. I'm not saying it, it is going to happen, but it's one scenario. Another scenario is that, you know, we make some really stupid choices around the way these things are deployed. And in the end, it's not really a fully zero carbon system. And it's not a properly resilient system because we've made bad design decisions, we've made you know, poor engineering decisions, um, 
you know, it could be, we might deploy it in a way which is so optimal, which means it's more expensive in some places, when it could be cheaper in other places. I mean, there's all sorts of things to think about. And then as a result, are you actually solving your problem when it comes to energy and dealing with climate? Maybe you're not. Um, so one of the, one, you know, and that's just two scenarios. And so one of the, so a lot of the, one of the study that I was involved in at Recent X, um, where we modeled this, well, we, we were kind of quite shocked to see that two degrees Celsius is baked in. Like it's just yeah. baked into every scenario. It's even baked into the, if we accelerated and just went crazy, um, to, you know, and got to a point where we might be able to, uh, if, you know, if we change the system rapidly enough, we could make some carbon withdrawal technologies and natural <laughs> carbon sequestration uh, approaches like, you know, forestation and things like that, we could make those a lot more viable. But even with all of that built in, you would still go over into the danger zone. And then your your hope is that you'd be able to get out of it fairly quickly. But in all those scenarios, you're looking at like, uh, you know, maybe five to 10 years, 10 years, it, you know, at, you know of, of getting into that climate danger zone. And I think okay, what we're on. seeing, yeah. Just, so, to, just, just, yeah. To, just to clarify. So um, in all of the models, just to clarify what baked in means. So in all the models that um, you were doing at Rethink X, we are going to breach two degrees extra warming. We're going to be there for at least five to 10 years. And in some scenarios where we accelerate and deploy some carbon removal technologies, a lot of them being natural ones like afforestation, then we can kind of bring it down. But we're talking five to 10 years at plus two degrees warming minimum. That's what that's what it looks like, you know, and... right. I mean, the model, I mean, at the end of the day, models are just models. We don't know for sure. We can hope for the best, but probably the models are underestimating. How, you know, I mean, I think it's, if, if anything is going to be wrong with models, it's that they're too conservative. Um, and and it is, it's really, it is complicated because we were modeling, you know, disruptions in energy transport and food. So we were looking at um, if you change the, uh, the energy transport and food systems, um, you know, what could you achieve? And, you know, so the, there was a study in Nature Energy, which just looked at the energy system. And they said, you know, if we, you know, they were like, you know, even without climate policies, you know, the, the whole geography of the energy system is going to be changed, you know, for the reasons I described. It was great, but they said, but it still looks like if we don't, if we don't, if, if it just carries on like this, it's a 2.6 degree Celsius rise, Celsius rise, you know. Um, so that's like, so this is, Interesting, right? Because they looked at one sector only, which suggests that, okay, maybe their model was slightly too um, underestimating, I'm sorry, overestimating the temperature rise because they only looked at one sec one one change. So we were looking at, okay, maybe three sector changing. So maybe it's, okay, so maybe it, okay we can accelerate. Um, but either way, that danger zone is there. And to, to me, it looks like we're moving into the danger zone. Like there's this, there's no, the conversation around 1.5 C, I get it. I, you know, I, I don't want to kind of be going around promoting doom, but is 1.5 C plausible? You know, most of the people that I've spoken to in the climate science community just don't believe this. They don't believe it's plausible. And the thing is, it might be plausible in the sense that you know, from a technical point of view, if you manage to get out of the two C danger zone fast enough, you know, from a, you know, because global average temperatures over time, you know, maybe you, maybe over time, then you're looking at global average temperatures of, of around 1.5 C, maybe you could still sustain, you know, maybe that's not completely beyond the pale. But I mean, end of the day, it's like, it's like we're, we're moving, we're moving into that danger zone. And I think that's the, uh, that's the key takeaway for me is that, we have tools to do this, but it's not just, it's not about the tools. It's about making the decisions. And the conversation that's happening right now is, is, you know, like you, you asked me, how do we get, how do we get, um, you know, politicians and these guys to kind of start waking up? And I don't know the exact, uh, yeah, get their heads out of their asses. <laughs> and I think one of the things that they, that we need to kind of communicate really clearly is that. First of all, I mean, there's two things really that I try to use is one is that guys, surely from a self-interest point of view, these industries that you are so invested in are all going to die. 
they're going to die now. And the thing is, is that if you are the, if you want to take your profits and ride it all the way to the bank, you're going to, you're, you're going to not find you might survive, but those companies won't, those industries won't, the workers won't, the societies that are dependent on those things won't. And everything would just go, that, that's an insane scenario. You, is that what you really want? Um, and I think on a human, t- there are people who are, I mean, there's obviously people who are just really just don't give a shit, right? But when I've spoken to people in, um, you know, like I've spoken to people in finance, I did a big talk at some uh, big investment firm in London once, and, uh, you know, spoken about all this stuff. And w- one thing I was shocked at was that they had no understanding of technology disruptions, the impact on industries, investment. They just had no clue. They were totally illiterate about that stuff. Mm. <laughs> they were scientifically illiterate in the sense they didn't really understand that the, the same rapid change dynamics we're talking about in technology are part of nature. Um, and that's why the climate system is incredibly complex. Change is non-linear. Um, because of these tightly coupled systems, you, you know, tipping point in one will, will hit a tipping point in another and those cascading effects, all that stuff, no idea. Well, these didn't hear about this stuff, didn't really get it. All they were thinking about, you know, one degree, two degree, three degree, you know, in this very kind of basic kind of the way it's been described in policymaking doesn't convey the speed and scale of, of change. So that, so that, that was really shocking for them. But one thing that was interesting was that when I spoke to them as a person, you know, as like, like guys, this is about us. This is about us now. And it's about our kids and it's about everything. This is the most important conversation that we can be having. They, that really resonated with them. And Mm -hmm. they were just like, wow, I've not really thought about it like this. Because normally what happens is, you know, they'll get guys like me who, and invariably they probably are guys and they'll go in there and they'll talk about, you know, ESG, you know, environment, social governments and metrics and blah, 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 you know, and, you know, I did talk, you know, we, we, we spoke about costs and we spoke about adoption curves. We spoke about, you know, is, you know, what are the new profitable industry, industries of the future, blah, 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 blah. Um, but when you get down to it, I think we have to connect with people on a really human level. Um, and I think that most people in a lot of these institutions and industries are just ordinary people. They're trying to make a living, um, but they're blinded by ideology. They're constrained by the systems in which they're operating in. They haven't quite understood stakes. The, the, yeah. the, the communication systems we have here are just, you know, the media is not doing its yeah. job. You know, the academics, we're all talking amongst, we're all talking amongst ourselves. So we need to find a way, I think, to really get the message to a lot of people in, in these institutions. And I think it, I think it can work in the sense that I've seen that people on an individual level were really struck that everybody in that room was like, just, they didn't know what to say to me at the end of the talk because they were just like, they were so shocked by what I was saying, you know, I was like literally telling them that you know, this current system is, is literally going to end in like 15 to 20 years. This system's not going to exist anymore. There's going to be something else, but what that something that looks like could be the end of us, or it could be something else, yeah. something good, something really interesting yeah. and viable and amazing, but that's up to you guys. And they were just yeah. like, okay. So I think somehow we have yeah. to find a way to reach people. I think it's interesting, right? Because there's so many, there's so, even in that just like last sentence, there's so, we could spend like three hours talking about that last sentence. We have to find a way to reach people because it's like, okay, and which people and people who are so invested in the current paradigm, are they ever going to change? And can you tear down the master's house with the master's tools? And do actually we need to be like decentralizing power and like rather investing in bottom up communities? Or do we need to be doing it all at once? And like, do we, do we, do we, do we, do we, you know, it, it's, it's really complicated. But I think for me, the main thing that I like come back to, because I was quite angry for a couple of years, I think, when I started my learning journey, I was really angry at how, you know, the fact that people have their heads up their asses, 
um, the fact that there's so much exploitation, extraction, all of these kinds of things. But people really, they just don't know. And how they don't know is kind of boggles my mind. But people really, they just don't know. They just don't know how bad the situation is. They just don't know how responsible they are for participating in the situation. And I think this is something that's so fascinating about neoliberal capitalism is that it disempowers even the powerful. It really makes them feel that there's nothing that they can do. The system is now so complex and so large that it is acting upon all of us to fulfill our roles within it. And if we refuse to fulfill our roles, it will simply remove us and input somebody else. And so it becomes this thing of like, well, it's actually not really about individuals and it hasn't been about individuals for a very long time. Like when you live on a planet of 8 billion people, it really isn't about uh, individuals anymore. And I like wrote this piece recently about um, about this. And I was like, you know, because I, I love to hate on Elon Musk as, uh, you know, most sane people do. And um, but I was thinking about the fact that like, Oh, actually, if Elon were to turn around and be like, actually, Tesla is now going to be a, you know, electric public transport system and yada, 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 yada. He he, suddenly his power would drop. And I think we have this impression that people who are in powerful um, connections, nodes, relationships, if they were to do something that would ripple out. But the thing that I wrote in the piece is that ripples like a smooth surface and disruption is friction. And so just by the act of disrupting, they would be like in in sort of exponentially disempowered. And so it's really interesting to be like, yeah, we do need to reach people, but we need to reach them as well in a way that like shores up that collective um, empowerment as each individual is gradually disempowered by trying to refuse or exit from the position they hold within the system. And this seems like a kind of, it seems like a mathematical equation that, you know, I don't have the answer to it at all. But especially within, within people within institutions, it's interesting because people like, when we think about bottom up communities, we think about, oh, you know, us on the street, we are so sort of like ineffectual, essentially. We need to band together in order to get something done. And that's a beautiful way to get something done. But it's also the same in institutions. They need to band together too because the system is working upon them to act differently. And I think one way of like communicating it, and I'm still not sure how okay I am with this because I'm really like anti um, playing the old paradigm game or like using language that perpetuates it. But nonetheless, there just seems so many opportunities coming up in the transition. Like from what I understand, and maybe you can speak to this, I hope you can speak to this, but from what I understand, one of like the fear of fossil fuel companies to transition is that they will have stranded assets. All of these oil and gas fields, all of these oil rigs, and that would kind of cause like a mini economic collapse, essentially, if we just left those out there. And they don't know what to do about that. And so to me, it appears like there's this great opportunity to like restructure a financial system then and be like, okay, so that we don't have an economic collapse that then ripples out and, you know, screws with people's pensions and incomes and job market and the stock market and everything. In order to avoid that, because we recognize that we're going to have to transition, maybe something we do is kind of like, you know, remove the for-profit maxim, for example, and rewrite um, codes with like ESGs that are actually about maximizing environmental returns rather than financial returns. Like it seems that there are just, this is the opportunity, not the business opportunity of the century, that's the language that I'm wary of, but real opportunities to be like, okay, if you want to survive this with the rest of us, like th- we're going to have to change everything. And if you don't want to be in a position where either your company has collapsed because you've been bullheaded about it and not educated yourself, or your company's collapsed because we're experiencing rapid e- ecological breakdown and billions of people displaced and, you know, g- kiss goodbye to your energy systems and all this kind of thing. Let's take the opportunity to change everything. And unfortunately, it really does seem that, like, we do need to get those people on board if we are going to change anything. Well, I think that's true. But I also think that everything is going to change. And I think the, I think. Yes. I think the biggest thing that we're not, that it, conversation that is not happening is that everything is going to change, is actually changing right now. And they don't, mm-hmm. the, the, 
we don't understand that. There is this delusion amongst fossil fuel industry, you know, incumbent industry. It's not just fossil, but fossil fuels, you know, the livestock industry, um, as well as the, you know, internal combustion engine vehicles. Those are, you know, in our, our analysis, you know, energy, those, those three sectors, energy, transport, and food, they account for 90% of emissions. So wow. the thing is, is that all of those sectors are, are rapidly changing and the incumbent industries in those sectors are going to collapse. There's, this is being driven by economic dynamics. It's going to happen. And, you know, and it's complex. I mean, in, in the fossil fuel industry, you know, there are above ground dynamics due to competition from, you know, these emerging energy technologies, but there's also stuff happening below ground. You know, there's the fact that we've shifted from very, you know, cheap forms of, of, of pitch of oil, crude oil, to increasingly expensive forms of fossil fuels, you know, sh shale, uh, tar sands, and the costs have gone up, the returns are going down. And the industries have had to borrow excessively to keep that going. Um, and it's turning into a total mess inside the industry. And all of those things are happening at the same time that they're also being disrupted from outside. Um, so I think what's really fascinating about the next kind of two decades is that that change is happening. Like, so this, this is going to happen. I think on the one hand, you have narratives from for instance, you know, the COP28 presidency of, you know, which is, you know, major Middle East oil producer, the UAE, which are basically saying, oh, you know, you have to partner with the, you know, oil and gas industry and you need to kind of, um, that, that, that there's not, it's not going to work without partnering with the, with the, with us guys. And they've co-opted that narrative and essentially are trying to prolong the life of these industries. Now, why are they doing that? They're doing that because of the things that you've said, right? Which is one, it's, you know, overarching objective of maximizing profits. Two, um, I think for a country like the UAE, which would consider itself part of the developing world, they feel that, oh, the West has gone on this trajectory. Um, and now we're being told that we can't. Now they should just piss off and we should do whatever we want. Um, and, you know, we've, got all our oil wealth and we're becoming big, you know, is solving all our problems and that's going to be fine. Three, there's it's clearly, you know, fundamental economic illiteracy, technological illiteracy, scientific illiteracy. But this is just not going to work, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. But if you're going to just, you know, let's just pump carbon capture on this dying system and then just stick hydrogen on it and then hope for the best. You know, guys, you're literally, you're going to accelerate your collapse. That's mm. And you're going to accelerate the collapse of the environment as well. That's just a nightmare. Like, are you guys insane? This yeah, is insane. Yeah. This is like you're bringing forward the apocalypse onto your own nation. <laughs> within, that's crazy. And we're all going to go down with you. Please stop. <laughs> so, I think, so there's kind of like this. There's a kind of like there's a kind of technical conversation in a way at one level, which is like, guys, have you really thought about this? Like this, this just doesn't make any sense. What you guys are doing. Is it viable to say that let's just keep doing this? It's not viable. So I think there's one, that's one thing. And then the next thing is that, okay, if we've realized, and some people are, you know, there are some people in these industries who are waking up and saying, this guy's is not going to work. We need to either change or we need to invest um, in different things. Um, you know, but for the most part, I think the biggest incumbents are just stuck, you know, like BP, Shell, Chevron. Exxon, you guys are just stuck in this paradigm. They don't want to move. They're still doing greenwashing, you know, all the rest of it. So I think the thing is, is that those guys are dinosaurs. Can we change the biggest dinosaurs? I don't know. Is it worth talking to them? I don't know. Should we, you know, is, are there people in those institutions that we should, that we should be having open lines of communication with? Yeah, sure. I don't never close the door, but they're going to, they're obsolete. Um, but I think I, I think the react, I think that message of obsolescence needs to be communicated, um, but not just you know not just to we, we can't just be a we, we have to speak to a wider community right. So who is going to who is who are the people that are going to lose? It's the workers who will lose out. It's shareholders in these companies who will lose out. 
we've seen that there are there are these movements of shareholders now linked to many different industries who are waking up and saying, actually, you know, we need to be activists. Climate change is real. Our industry needs to change. The bottom line is also at stake. So I think there's an interesting way of kind of combining the, this kind of these two kind of things. One is kind of like the traditional old paradigm way of thinking, right? Shareholders and, you know, the bottom line is not going to work. We need to change. And then kind of infusing that with the kind of more transformational kind of, of awareness that, well, guys, um, this whole bottom line thing that, that we're going on, none of this is going to work if we don't completely change everything, because the way that the new system looks is going to be totally different. How does that new system look? How does, how does a new energy system that is really going to work actually look? Cause it's going to be owned, has to be distributed. It's got to be owned and controlled. Most, you know, people and households and communities and small businesses are going to be owners of energy now, producers of energy, producers of food. How is that going to work? How is that going to look? How do we structure that? Um, and I think that's the kind of, kind of, and I think the, the kind of the tremendous opportunities of that also need to be really kind of understood as well. Because I think the other thing that, that's happening is because we're getting so, because there's so much alarmist news and it's not that it's wrongly alarmist, it's all rightly alarmist. What's often missing from the conversations, I think, is, is that sense of what's possible in a good way. That you know, we could really have, we could, we could really move into a system in which um, people have access to, you know, people don't want, you know, there isn't scarcity because we're we're living in a system where scarcity is created by the fact that we're the, by our relationship to nature. We have a completely fundamentally different relationship to nature that that opens up abundance because your your whole paradigm is shifting. And that's all, that's all linked to these things about, wait, let's, you know, how, do we need to rethink growth? I mean, one of, one of the things that, um, that we were really interested in at Rethink X was, you know, this, the, you know, the people, the whole people who went growth and degrowth. And a lot of the things that we were saying was that if you look at the system, the new system that it emerges, by all the factors that you're looking at, the, the material throughput is going to decrease massively. Like so, just looking at the technical stuff, like the materials was going to massively decrease because the mining levels for fossil fuels and the mining levels um, for these new are totally different. Um, even with like um, we're looking at, you know, in the food sector, we're looking at a combination of these things. There's regenerative agriculture. There's this new that there's the big disruptions taking place with precision ferment, fermentation and cellular agriculture, which could mean that we could create animal proteins. I mean, plant-based proteins, we're doing it now, but animal proteins without killing animals. How much land could you free up from the livestock industry? I mean, massive and massive, and billions of hectares of land will, would potentially be available. And what could you do with that? Rewilding, regenerative agriculture, reforestation, so much amazing stuff. And, and, your, and your footprint, you know, your material footprint, then you could decrease. So there's loads of amazing opportunities, but what's really interesting is that you know, the old paradigm metrics won't capture that. So, the, so the, the kind of natural and human wealth that you could create in that system, you can't measure it because we think everything in material terms. GDP measures material throughput. What does it look like when your system's material throughput has shrunk, but your possibility space has opened up? You can't measure that with GDP. It's still going to work. So we're going to be sitting there thinking, oh, let's measure GDP. GDP. So, so this is the interesting thing. I mean, that's why I, I, I've, I don't really, I, I find the growth degrowth debate you know, kind of interesting, but I don't know whether it's got the answers because I think the new system is just going to be totally different. Like, I don't think it's going to be captured by these old ways of thinking about how we measure things. Um, yeah. But that's exciting to me. But those are convers I think those are opportunities that we don't quite see. And it's so yeah. important for yeah. us to see it because if we don't see it, then we can't be like, we can't get excited about the future. And, and that's one thing that um, I know you, I think you want to be supported, but I just wanted to finish one thing, which I, like with, my, yeah. with my kids, for instance, I mean, this is the thing that 
really bugs me is, is I want them to be able to see a future for themselves, right? And, you know, for their generation, how can they see that if the narrative is just with the species that have fucked up the planet and now we have to restore it and that's it, as opposed to we fucked up the planet, but actually, you know, we've learned a lot from that and we can actually create an even, a, a really amazing system. It's better than anything we've created. And we can actually do this, guys. We can do this now. And that's the story that I want to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Redemption. Re a little bit of uh, repenting as well for our sins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think this idea that like human, humankind as steward is such a lovely and beautiful story. And I think you really see it in our capacity for, for care and for love and compassion and empathy and how we feel drawn towards other species. We desire to take care of other species. We desire to take care of each other. It is so bleeding obvious that if you were to put a label on what we are within the wider ecosystem, it is steward. And I think this whole story of like, humankind is a bacteria we just expand and use up all of the resources until we're done or we're bad we're fun we're fundamentally um wrong in some kind of way like or even spiritually like deformed it's really 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 destructive it is it, it's it fails to capture a lot of the good things that we have done with the technology and the energy and everything that's been available to us but it also really fails to capture that which is inherent in the vast majority of people. And I want to build a world that reflects what is inherent in the vast majority of people, not a world that is reflective of the uh, strategies used by minority in order to get ahead. Not a world that I fear, because we live in a world that is run on fear right now. And that is so, it's so distressing. And it, I think when you kind of boil it down to sort of emotions like that, it's it's very obvious, right? Like everybody is scared. Everybody's scared of what is happening, what's going to happen, how they're going to survive, all of this kind of thing. And then you see in like moments of crisis, like COVID and mutual aid networks pop up and you see just how loving, caring, capable, collective, compassionate people are. Like it's within us. We just need to, no, I don't know. We just need, I don't know. I actually can't even finish that sentence. I don't know what we need to do, but it's there. So there is so much to be hopeful, optimistic, determined, and passionate about. The thing that I was getting excited about before <laughs> when you were talking was this idea of like material throughput. And man, I love the world. I love the universe. Cause like I just was thinking about that for the first time yesterday. And I want to tell you a funny story in a piece. All right. So I was with a friend and I was saying like, right, okay, imagine we buy a fossil fuel company and we retire it. Yeah. And we need to still make like 5% returns. And I was like, is that, is that degrowth in a way? Because you're, you know, you're minimizing your financial returns and you're changing, you're retiring the infrastructure or you're repurposing it for renewables. And we, 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 we couldn't quite figure it out. So I was like, okay, let's make it simpler. Imagine I buy a lemon sherbet machine for a hundred pounds and I need to make a hundred and six pounds to get my investment. And I mean, I wish I could, I wish I could like make a little hole in the time space, um, you know, network and like put you back there. Cause it was, we were, I mean, I had tears running down my face. It was so funny. <laughs> it, like at one point we were like, and we were like trying to decide what the prices of everything should be. And we were like, hang on, is this just what business is? You just make it <laughs> up. <laughs> but my point was you buy a lemon sherbet machine and you're like, okay, I'm going to use this lemon sherbet to make strawberry creams. And strawberry creams oh, wow. have um, the, the input is less, right? Mm. So the cost to make strawberry creams are less. So therefore you can make less strawberry creams to still make the return that you need. And I was like, is, is that degrowth? Is that a deliberate contraction of material resources in order to still meet the financial returns that warrant making the investment in order to take the thing offline and transition and retire it in the first place? And I mean, we thought yes, but we also spent about half an hour trying to figure out an equation that actually wasn't possible to figure out. So maybe you'll be able to shine some light on the lemon sherbet strawberry cream. <laughs> conundrum. Wow, that's great. That's a great conversation. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is something that I've thought. So this is what is one of the things that we were thinking about was, you know, what happens if you if you take the ideal design for a renewable energy system. The, what what you would do is, you know, and you know, discussed this previously. You know, you would um, there's a least cost system design that you could do, which is to um, get, kind of build out the generating capacity. Um, much bigger than you would currently think you would normally do. Um, around three times to five times, depending on where you are. And what's funny about that is that it sounds like, oh, what you're building a bigger system. Isn't that, is that a good idea? But what's interesting about it is that the materials that you need for the, for that stuff, you know, for building out the generating capacity are pretty much abundant, you know, like steel, aluminium, uh, silicon, blah, blah, blah. That's that's already not too much of a problem, but it's the battery component is the is pretty is the biggest yeah. kind of cost component of the system. It's the most materially intensive. Um, so as you do that, you actually the overall system is actually less intensive because you need ninety percent less batteries. So that was uh, one really interesting thing. Um, so you're so because you've got. Because obviously you've got generating capacity is higher, so actually you you're able to deal with intermittency a lot better. You just need less storage. Um, sorry, 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 yeah. sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I, let's just clarify that. So we've got we're, so we're building out our capacity. So that means like a solar farm becomes three to five times bigger than you would ordinarily think. So, and then because of that, you need ninety percent less battery storage. But what happen? What happens when it's a cloudy day? How does that extra three hundred, five hundred percent capacity actually serve to keep generating electricity without a storage component? So it, it works because it works on a. It won't work on a farm level. It will right. work on a system wide level. So oh, the models see. that we've done are kind of like, you know, whole regions basically. If you and the way it works, obviously, is is ideally you know solar and wind. Yeah. So when the solar is a little bit lower, you've got the wind. When the wind is a little bit lower, you've got solar. Um, and because it's region wide, um, then you know if there's low low parts in one part of the system, then you can transmit across. So it, oh. it re- so the rec- sorry, requires so, so, yeah. So you're like sorry, sorry, sorry but you're like it's yeah. like um okay so if I if we build out uh, across Europe and then it's like blisteringly boiling in Greece and they're making loads and loads of energy and it's really cloudy in Scotland, Kelsapries, then it could like send that extra energy through to the places that are having uh, less windy and less sunny days essentially at that moment. So it's about sheer. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So this mm. is so th- I mean I think th- uh, there's and there's different studies looking at different elements of this, right? So. You know, so a lot of the models we did at Resync X were were regional within like so we looked a lot, so the study was um they did a study of California and they did a mm-hmm. study of Texas and we did a study of um was it Minnesota, I think, I can't remember. Um and then some other research groups have looked at other areas as well. Um they've looked at some people have looked at countries, some people have looked at just, you know, towns and cities. And pretty much the model stands up that if you if you kind of you know supersize it in that way, the generating capacity, you can reduce the battery storage quite a lot. But what's interesting is is if, and then if, what you mentioned like with Europe, Europe is obviously you know let's go trans border, right? Yeah, that's also another thing you could do, which is the interconnections. Like if you if you have really good good interconnections across. Um, so there was one study that showed, not there's a totally different study, just looking at imagine if the whole world created a big global interconnected grid. And they're like, well, you could reduce battery storage by 50% because you could do all this transmitting and stuff like that. And they weren't looking at the supersizing element of it. So what's really interesting is that if you, you know, if you take these studies together, what you can see is that, well, if you build out the system in the right way, you could have loads and loads of surplus electricity available and you could have ma- much less battery storage needed. And obviously you don't necessarily just need battery storage. You could use other forms of storage, which are you know, like pumped hydro storage, which is about moving water around. You know, there's different things you could do which don't even involve kind of electrochemical storage. Um, but let's, you know, keeping it simple, you know, you had less battery storage, but grid interconnections means, guys, we have to share the energy across borders in a cooperative and intelligent way. Yeah. Um, 
and that's and what's really interesting about that scenario is that you find that the material throughput. So if you built out the system, you know, most of the studies show that like solar panels don't do they thirty years and the degradation has gone down to about eighty percent or something. Probably don't even need to necessarily replace it then. Keep it going for fifty years, um, and you know this this stuff is improving all the time. So it's really, what after you've built the system, the system will sit there for like 30, 40, 50 years, and you don't have to. There's no more inputs. There's no more material inputs at that point. Which they, there's kind of minimal inputs to kind of maybe repair things now and again here and there, but it's essentially like a becomes a stock um, rather than a flow because at the moment we're dealing with flows of natural resources, right? Which are going into the system. This then becomes a stock that sits there and you don't have to do anything with it for like between 30 to 50 years. Um, so it's got this zero marginal cost, right? So there's all this amazing kind of surplus electricity, which is being produced essentially for free once you've built it. There's no material, the material throughput is minimized quite dramatically at that point. And, and then, but you're, but so, but what you can do with that stuff is electricity is interesting, right? Because then you could do stuff like, and this is what we found really exciting because at the moment, the paradigm is curtailment. But this old paradigm thinking, oh, we've got too much solar energy coming into the system at this point. So we need to curtail it because we can't use it in the grid. So what we're, what we're saying is that's stupid. Don't curtail it, use it. You know, mm -hmm. just, just build a better grid and you can use that electricity and you can do loads of cool stuff. You know, you can, you know, now wastewater treat all the stuff that we're doing now, which is so carbon intensive, you can do with that clean electricity. And I guess one of the exciting things that we saw, and this is what we built into the model, was that direct air capture, for instance, which is an insane thing that you can't do right now because you're just using fossil fuels to do it. In, the, in a new system, which is clean electricity, it totally might work. You could actually say, okay, now we've built a system, we can try and draw down all the, some of that crazy amounts of carbon in the atmosphere and do something useful with that carbon. Maybe we need to put it in the ground. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a massive expert, but you know, people are trying to create useful things out of that stuff. But there's lots of things you can now do with that clean electricity. And one of them is build out a real circular economy. So again, in the fossil fuel system, you know, circular economy, it's expensive doesn't really make sense because you're using so much fossil fuel energy also to do circular economy, recycling materials, blah, blah, blah. Whereas you have lots of surplus clean electricity, then you now have a way to recycle all those. So, and we're going to have to do it, right? Because after 30 to 50, at some point, you're going to have to start replacing that system that you've just built yeah. out. So do you want to start burning through the earth all over again? Or do you want to start having a system in place that allows you to make careful use of the metals and materials that you've now deployed? Well, you can, you can start, you can actually create that system with this. So that's, that's the opportunity that I see. And what's exciting about that is how do you measure that? It doesn't fit any of the metrics that we have now, right? Because, okay, you can produce massive amounts of essentially free electricity, which is only controlled by, ideally only controlled by communities and people. Um, it's trans-border, it's interconnected. So we're, we're like a massive global community sharing our resources together, intelligently allocating energy and resources where it's needed. And we're all uh, helping each other share and reuse our resources. It's not infinitely growing into forever, but there's, there's, there's real abundance, um, which could clearly open up lots of opportunities for prosperity, but the material throughput that you measure with GDP is, is, has you managed to minimize that. And those flows that you would normally hope to kind of measure prosperity by aren't happening in the way that you normally would have to do. I mean, the, the existing economic metrics cannot understand how this system would look. It's just completely beyond conception. I don't think degrowth either. I don't think degrowth captures this system. I think to me, degrowth, I mean, I think maybe a lot of the ideas that people talk about in degrowth are in this, in this system. But for me, the idea is, I mean, to me, this is, I guess it's a semantic question really, but 
degrowth and growth are just, to me, they just feel, it feels like an old debate about a system which is completely different, but it's fundamentally about how do you create a system which allows you to flourish within planetary boundaries um, and have a, have, have a kind of, to finally reach a state of kind of parity with, with the earth where you're not basically endlessly kind of just ravaging the planet to a point where, you know, it's, it's not going to, you know, you're going to, it's going to eventually just start collapsing. Um, you know, and yeah, I don't think we don't have the metrics to measure that, but that's, it's, that's what, I think that's what's possible. Yeah. I think something that's really exciting about that vision is what it, how it would transform geopolitics in the way that the creation of Europe transformed geopolitics. So you, if you have countries that are not like haggling and barting and trading anymore, but are sharing, then you are creating a global network of allies, real allies, and everyone who is connected into the grid benefits of the well-being of everyone else who is connected into the grid. And like Absolutely. that is also what we need. We need this kind of infrastructure that reflects a new political reality because if our politics aren't going to change and they very well might not, we need things that are going to drag them into the new paradigm because they do seem awfully behind, I have to say. They do seem like they will be the last to change, but that's what's so exciting about it. And I think that's was where we're like, sort of even this is a thing that I ordinarily complain about, but like, you know, the mass uh, power of capital, of business, of corporations that are transnational, and international, these are things that they could achieve where politics will not and thus begin to create the, that like um, disturbance and then possibly ripple effect throughout. So I like that, Nafiz. I'm going to go away and read a lot about that. Thank you very much. And um, my final question for you today is who would you like to platform? So I would like to platform uh, a fellow called Hugo Bardi. He oh, is. Oh, I've had Earth... Hugo. You've had Hugo. Oh, I've wow. had Hugo. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh wow! Have a poem again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you know what? I will. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, because I was. I was literally having an email conversation with him. So he was the first name that came to mind. Hugo's lovely. That's good job. He's so lovely. He's you know what? You're yeah. right. I will get him back on. He's an absolute legend. Nafis, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Thank you, Rachel. Really appreciate it. Love conversation. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.